Hello and welcome everyone to today's session of Surgery Online. My name is Magdalena Schweisgut. I'm the product manager for passive medial implants at Medal headquarters in Innsbruck. And today I am very much looking forward to our session with the exciting uh, topic of endoscopic staphys surgery, pearls, pitfalls and surgical steps for using clip prosthesis. I, and I am also very excited about our speaker today, which I will, will present you in a minute. But bef before we do that, I want to give you a few tips and tricks to make this experience as smooth as possible for you. So in case you haven't named yourself correctly, you can still change your name by right clicking on on the particip participants panel, um, uh, click on rename and enter your correct name. Then uh, to avoid any background noise, we would kindly ask you to mute yourself so that we don't hear any um, unwanted noise during uh, the presentation. And for a stable internet connection, we recommend to close all background um, software such as MS Teams or Microsoft so that the connection is stable during this whole session. Um, as always, please feel free to type your comments uh, and questions in the chat. Um, we will have a few minutes after the presentation to go um, into your uh, comments and questions and to have a nice, lively discussion. So, and now, today I am really uh, happy that we have um, a very special speaker, Mr. Asad Kayum, um, and he has a very impressive Vita, and I would like to share some uh, points here today with you. So he's a consultant otolaryngologist at Northwest Anglia Foundation Trust in Petersburg. Um, he is the training uh, a program director of ear, nose and throat surgery in Health Education England, as well as a member specialist of the Advisory Committee United Kingdom. He's also a regional council member of ENT UK, as well as regional professional specialty advisor to Royal College of Surgeons in England. He is, he is a former clinical uh, director of Head and Neck Services, Northwest Anglia Foundation Trust, and he was appointed a consultant in 2012. He is also a former scientific research fellow at the Sanger Genome uh, Institute and a former clinical, um, uh, sorry, a former senior clinical fellow at Royal Darwin Hospital Australia and Edinburgh's Hospital in Cambridge. As a surgeon, Mr. Kayum has a special interest in uh, endoscopic ear surgery, in management of extensive cholesteatoma, management and prevention of uh, retraction pockets, ossicular reconstruction, stapes surgery, and management of patients with um, balance problems. Mr. Kayum has presented his work in um, uh, across four continents, which is really impressive. And he has more than 50 publications, including textbooks, um, chapters on his name. So this is a really impressive Vita, and I am very much looking forward to um, seeing his presentation today. Now, which prosthesis are we going to see? Um, so this is the MFIX stapes prosthesis. This is a, a, a stapes prosthesis from Medell with a self-retaining clip. So this clip doesn't need a manual crimping or a laser. It can simply be pushed over the long process of the incus and will stay in place. It is available in different uh, functional lengths from 3.5 millimeters to 5.5 millimeters and in piston diameters between uh, of 0.4 and 0.6 millimeters. And with this, um, it's all from my side and I am happy to hand over uh, to Mr. Kayum. Kayum, can you, Mr. Kayum, can you hear us? Uh, yes, I can. Can you hear me, Magdalena? We hear you perfectly. Thank you. <laughs> and can you see my screen? Uh, not yet. You can uh, maybe share it again. Okay. I'll share my screen. And I'm going to switch my phone off so there's no disturbance. Perfect. Can you share my screen, see my screen now? Yes, we see it now. Thank you. Perfect. Well, Magdalena, thank you very much uh, for having me here. And I'm grateful to Medel for inviting me for this presentation uh, this afternoon, wherever you are in the world. I'm actually, I'm sorry, I'm not in my operating room today. I'm speaking to you from the warm Oman Muscat where I'm here for a conference. Um, and I must say it's, an, it's a privilege to be here talking at this esteemed platform. Um, and I'm grateful to Medel and to all uh, for having me here this afternoon. So without further delays, I'll talk to you about endoscopic stapes surgery. Um, and some pearls, pitfalls from personal experience and how to ensure that your surgery is successful and to avoid um, uh, uh, having 
unsatisfactory results. So I will initially start by giving a disclaimer that I have no financial conflict of interest here. Uh, all the videos here belong to my patients and I have consent to use these videos. Uh, some images have been taken on the internet and these are openly available on the World Wide Web. So um, no issues with the infringement of copyright. I will mention to just introduce everyone where I'm based. So I work in a place called Peterborough, which is about 78 miles north of London. Um, so not too far away and quite close to Cambridge. Um, and on the right of the screen, you will see the hospital where all the action is carried out. And that is my base from where I will uh, I operate from. So some basic statistics and epidemiology with reference to the British population. Um, this is was a, from a paper and published not too long ago. And essentially, this was in a, a, a recent resurvey of the patients within the British cohort who present with autosclerosis. And essentially, the statistics haven't changed much. Still, uh, predominantly women are affected more than men. However, what has become quite clear is that there is no association with measles or any other viruses as was uh, a concept in the previous generation. I mentioned that when the onset is earlier on in life, the chances of an individual developing bilateral autosclerosis, uh, particularly on a background of family history is almost 40%, which is reasonably high. Uh, along with that, the, the, uh, it has an autosomal dominant inheritance pattern with, redu with reduced penetrance, which means that there are multiple etiological factors which are into play in, for, in giving rise to autosclerosis. In other words, we cannot lay focus on one specific factor such as genetics only in saying that this is the only factor giving rise to autosclerosis. However, when there is presence of the genetic element, the chances are higher particularly of bilateral disease and the presentation is in comparatively earlier age group. So this was a an audit, this was a survey post AP surgery from the British otologist published not very long ago. And, uh, and I would say this is very much for the current generation of otologists uh, practicing in the UK, TAP's operation. So now 91%, in other words, majority of the surgeons undertake stapedotomy and virtually everyone will offer their patients the option of a hearing aid before they undergo surgery. A majority of the operations are actually performed under general anesthesia and, as, and half of them are done as day case. We, it's a very small percentage, and this was actually surprising for me, who are using laser in the UK and the rest are using a combination of either a perforator or a skeeter drill in order to uh, complete the surgery. The commonest prostheses that are used were the coarse prosthesis, uh, SMART, or, and the Teflon. And it is now an acceptable practice that if an individual otologist who is doing six to 10 stapes operation a year will be considered to be within safe remit of maintaining safe practice, because it is very important as it is a fine operation with micro movement one has to be in regular routine practice of undertaking this operation. Uh, the interesting thing was that almost 70%, which is three fourths of the individuals, uh, would allow the intern to undertake the operation in its entirety or in part, but only if the intern has a specialist interest in otology and intends to practice otology in the future as an area of subspecialty interest. So in order to ensure that we have good, healthy outcomes for surgery, the operation I would, uh, I have uh, the way I've laid out this presentation, I've divided into the earlier stages, which is planning and diagnosis, how to ensure that surgically you have progressed safely and what problems one can, be, can arise in the post-operative period and how one can manage them successfully. So in the initial planning and diagnosis period, we will divide this, present, this presentation into a history, examination, hearing tests, and a radiological support. So I think in history, 
I cannot emphasize enough the importance of the profession of an individual. So if you are an individual, if you have a patient who is a ballerina or somebody who works at height, such as who cleans uh, windows in a high rise building or a tree doctor, you need to be ensuring that you have a very open and a frank conversation with the individual of the risk of developing a dead ear, which may give rise to dizziness and that can affect have a negative effect on their livelihood. Similarly, if you have an individual who is a trumpet blower or works as in, so for example, as an underwater welder on shipping industry, and I've had these patients, I would actually talk them against having the surgery because of the risk of prosthesis getting uh, displaced due to changes in pressure, which can give rise to sudden uh, deafness, but also vertigo and that can have a detrimental effect on their life. Hence, the profession is very, very important in the history. Apart from that, there are regular usual factors, which I'm sure you will look at. However, if the patient has any of the following symptoms, which can give rise to vertigo or dizziness, I would actually treat it with caution and probably not consider performing a stapes operation because of the long-term risks associated. In examination, for me, it is very important that I look at the size of the auditory canal and the angulation of the ear canal, because this essentially helps me decide whether I can safely undertake an endoscopic uh, stapedectomy, which is my routine practice, or do I have to undergo a permeatal or an end oral approach in order to successfully complete this surgery without any complications? At the same time, if the patient has got any other factors or complications, which are, are comorbid factors, which can prevent me from safely accessing the middle ear cleft, such as osteomas of the external auditory canal or a perforation of the tympanic membrane, these have to be treated before I actually go ahead with the stapes operation. At the same time, if a patient has got retraction or a cholesteatoma, then I would, uh, uh, then I know the cause for the conductive hearing loss is not uh, autosclerosis. And in that case, I will be uh, um, uh, sorting these problems out. Looking behind the ear to exclude a previous scar, because there are times when patients may forget to mention it to you, or if there are branchial arch anomalies, and I have been caught once when I came across with a patient who had a first arch fistula, and I had to stop the operation and uh, stop, wake the patient up, discuss the diagnosis, and make sure that is treated before we talk about the conductive hearing loss. Now, hearing tests, are important. And actually for myself, I would say the audiogram is the most important assessment and I have to make sure that it is repeatable uh, uh, on at least more than one occasion. Tuning folk test is important, uh, but not as important and a negative Rennie's test would not stop me from proceeding with uh, surgery. When I started Stapes operation, a conductive hearing loss of about 35 to 40 decibels was sufficient enough for me to, uh, to go ahead with Stapes operation. But with practice and experience, I'm now able to go ahead and perform a stapedotomy operation, even in a patient who has 20 decibel conductive hearing loss. Tympanograms do not sway your diagnosis one way or the other. And stapedial reflexes historically did have a strong value. However, you have to remember that they are not always absent in autosclerosis. And if a patient has got a positive third window, in those cases, the stapedial reflexes can still be present. And I just played this video. This is not uh, from doing stapes operation, but just to show you Stapes, uh, a, a, a positive uh, a reflex. If you look, I'm stimulating the facial nerve and you will see the stapedius moving. And this is classified as a, a positive stapedial reflex, which is actually negative in patients with autosclerosis. 
Similarly, transient autoacoustic emission can be neg uh, can is supposed to be negative, but actually it is absent in patients with healthy ears, particularly if the hearing thresholds are worse than 30 decibel. So once again, not a reliable factor. And in my opinion, the only reliable factor here is a repeatable audiogram confirming a conductive loss. So when I was training, I was told that in order to go ahead and perform a stapy surgery, you do not require any form of radiological investigations. And I, when I started Stapy's operation about nine years ago as a consultant, that was my practice. However, moving on since then, I am now for the last five to six years undertaking a regular uh, CT scan uh, before the patients are listed for Stapy's operation. And my radiologist has two protocols. One is a cholestatoma protocol, and one is a Stapy's protocol. And this is the STAPES protocol. And what I'm interested in looking is the relationship of the facial nerve to the oval window. Is the facial nerve dehiscent or is the bony covering intact? What is the situation of the health of the cochlea on both the sides? Anatomy and the location and size of the vestibular aqueduct. Assessment of the round window and Possibly, if there is any doubt suggesting a stapedial artery which may be present. And now let me take you through some of the scans. So this is um, the, the location, or this is the uh, a coronal view of, uh, of the temporal bone. And this is the level at which I would assess the location of the facial nerve and its relationship to the oval window. We call it the dancing mermaid sign, where the, on, the, on the image, which is visible on the left side of your screen, the black arrow points to the superior semicircular canal, the yellow arrow points to the lateral semicircular canal, the white arrow is the promontory, and the orange arrow points towards the footplate. And in this picture, you can, in this picture of the scan, you can see that the facial nerve is sort of exposed and probably missing the bony covering. Whilst the image on the right side of your screen clearly shows that there is an overhanging facial nerve, the bone covering it is intact, but there is actually stenosis of the oval window, which means that if I have to go ahead and do a stapy surgery in this operation, I have to tell the patient that I probably will have to drill more which means, and probably even drill a bit of promontory for access, which means the patient may end up with some degree of sensorineural hearing loss in the region of eight, uh, eight kilohertz. So high frequency sensorineural hearing loss. In this scan, you can see that the facial nerve is dehiscent. And if the nerve is dehiscent, particularly on the right side, uh, on the left side, you can see it is almost covering the footplate and possibly even bifurcating. And in such cases, preoperatively, I know that the chances of me completing this surgery successfully is not very great. And I, it will not stop me from proceeding with the operation, but it will definitely stop me uh, tell, allow me to tell the patient that I may not be able to complete this surgery successfully. I also want to look at the status of the cochlea. And if there is opacification within the cochlea, or if there is cochlear otosclerosis, this patient is certainly not a candidate for stapedectomy or stapedectomy. And this is a patient who will, needs to be referred across for assessment for cochlear implantation. And if an individual has got sensory neural hearing loss with a superadded conductive element, please, without a shadow of doubt, don't forget to look at the cochlea clearly because the patient can have cochlear otosclerosis. Now, these are the real life images, uh, uh, the, this is a real um, scan of a, this is the real, uh, an audiogram of a true patient of mine. This lady 
came to see me with a diagnosis of autosclerosis bilaterally. And she told me that she was diagnosed with this condition 35 years ago and has taken her time to decide, but now she wants to have bilateral stapes operation performed and she wants me to do the surgery on her. And she already had made up her mind to, to the extent that she almost convinced me as well, that's the right thing to do. Now, when I went ahead and did a CT scan on this patient, I was able to identify that this lady has got, a, if you notice, I'm moving magnifying. So she had bilateral superior semicircular canal dehiscence. As you can see, this is a right-sided superior semicircular canal dehiscence picked up with a highlighted blue arrow. And on the other side also, the patient had a superior semicircular canal dehiscence. It was after doing this uh, uh, scan that I was able to tell my patient and tell her that, look, stapy surgery is not the answer to your problem. And you have got superior semicircular canal dehiscence and, your, and the surgery is not, this, is not going to solve your problem. So looking at all these various um, aspects of the anatomy of the skull, which can help you decide one way or the other preoperatively without actually either not operating successfully or not having successful surgery is the reason why radiology is so important. Once again, the size and the relationship of the aqueduct is important. Now, if a patient has got an enlarged vestibular aqueduct, I would advise that we should talk against doing a, C, a, a, a stapes operation because of the higher risk of developing a perilymph gusher. If a patient still insists on having this operation, you can actually have, a, have an informed consent with the patient to tell them the reason why you would want to or not want to do the operation and the risks associated with it. This is very difficult to find, uh, which is a persistent stapedial artery. It's not commonly picked up. I haven't seen a single one, and these images are borrowed, as I've mentioned earlier on. Uh, but if there is a persistent stapedial artery, or if you see a hazy opacification where a radiologist may suggest a persistent stapedial artery, in that case, I would suggest that you need to investigate this further with the help of an angiogram, and I'll tell you why later on. Now, surgically, it is very important to assess, to ensure that the position of the patient is correct. So in the operative or perioperative state, after ensuring that the correct side is marked, and I have done a checklist with the anesthetist, I make sure that the patient is on the bed in a supine position and with a sandbag at the patient's neck with a slight extension or hyperextension of the patient's neck. My an anesthetist always, uh, my, I always operate under general anesthesia and the anesthetist will ensure that the patient has total intravenous anesthetic. Facial nerve monitoring is always used and, uh, and the anesthetist will give a gram of tranexamic acid to reduce bleeding intraoperatively. And I would, inject a 2.2 ml of one in 80,000 lignospan in a dental needle with a dental syringe to ensure that there is adequate hemostasis within the auditory canal. And people talk about multiple site injections and you can clearly see just having the needle held at one spot where at the junction of the bone and cartilage, I'm able to infiltrate the auditory canal and get a very decent blanching within the auditory canal. I would always wash my patient's ears with betadine prior to the operation and aqueous betadine to ensure there is no alcohol present. After uh, making an incision, I would ensure that the flap is safely elevated and making sure that there is no trauma to the flap. The incision is usually from around six o'clock uh, to the level uh, of about 12 o'clock. And once the incision is made, I would safely elevate the flap, ensuring that I have good access to the middle ear and making sure the ear canal is nice and dry with minimal amount of bleeding uh, dropping in. And if there is any, and I use cotton pledgets or cottonoids, which are soaked in adrenaline. 
once we are in the middle ear cleft, uh, once I have elevated the flap, I need to ensure that the ossicles are mobile and you can sometimes get fixation of malleus or uh, um, uh, ligament fixation. And in this image, after in this video, after I elevated the flap, there was some degree of fixation of the posterior malleolar ligament. And I used an NVR, you can see it is not fully mobile, and I used an NVR blade uh, to divide it. And following on from that, the, mal the malleus became mobile. Then I would curette the posterior wall of the auditory canal to have access to the foot plate. This is not a compulsion. It is not done on every occasion if the access is available, and it's only done if needed because endoscope gives, gives the extra benefit that you can op, you can proceed without uh, 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 without actually curette, curettage. You have to remember that the coda tympani travels from the facial nerve in the posterior wall of the auditory canal under the pars flaccida and goes behind the neck of the malleus as visible in this cadaveric dissection. And it is important that when we are uh, curating the posterior canal wall, you are careful that at the top, the incus is not subluxated, it can happen easily. And posteriorly with the belly of the of the curette, the, the coda does not get crushed. Now, if, as I mentioned earlier, if you do encounter a persistent stapedial artery, once you have safely elevated your tympanometal flap, it is important that you hold yourself back. The reason is because the stapedial, a persistent stapedial artery is a connection between the internal carotid artery and the middle meningeal artery. And it is the vessel which is an embryonic remnant. Now, normally, stapedial artery is always present. And actually, the stapes develops around the stapedial artery and around sixth or seventh month intragestational period. The stapedial artery should completely disappear. And the ring of the suprastructure should remain. But if this is present and you identify it, I haven't come across one as yet, and if you identify it, you have to make sure that you do not divide it. Because if you divide it, and this is the sole blood vessel supplying the middle meningeal artery, you, will, you are at a high risk of giving patient a stroke, which is irreparable and a complication for which there will not be much forgiveness. But subsequently, we then have to confirm autosclerosis and ensure that it is the stapes that is fixed and not any other of the ossicles. You need to ensure that the round window reflex um, is present, is absent, because, however, it is not always that you can see the round windows due to adhesions or the location of the round window. However, what is important is to make sure that there is no bony obliteration or there is no sclerosis around or spongiosis around the round window, and you should really have picked it up on the scans earlier on as well. Once this is done, uh, then you need to use a measuring gauge to measure the size of the prosthesis. Now, as you mentioned, as you notice in this video, my measuring gauge is actually sitting under the long process of incus up to the stapes foot plate. But you can use the, uh, the measuring gauge lateral to the incus. And in such scenarios, you will have to take away 0.25 millimeter, 2.5 millimeter, depending on the thickness of the incus. And this is the m fix prosthesis that Magdalena showed you earlier. And whichever prosthesis you use, you've got to ensure that you know what is the functional working length of your prosthesis and from where you have to measure. Similarly, you have to ensure you measure the diameter of the base of the prosthesis, which is going to penetrate the foot plate because your fenestration in the foot plate has to be at least 0.1 to 0.2 millimeters wider than the uh, prosthesis itself. 
And this was a 4.5 millimeter prosthesis that I use. And as you can see in the image on your left side of your screen, this prosthesis measures 4.5 millimeter on this against the scale. And on the right side, you can see that on the, on the cartoon, the measuring rod is actually lateral to the stapes. In my experience, I've started to measure it me lateral to the incus. In my experience, I've started to measure it medial to the incus because then I know that whatever measurement I'm getting is correct. And it doesn't matter how thick the incus is, the measurement will be correct. And there are, there are two gauges which are available to use um, to measure the one on the top is used by uh, is one where the slide the scale slides inside and out, and the one used at the bottom is uh, where it has fixed measurements. I use a laser to divide. I also actually use a laser to divide the stapedius tendon here, and once the stapedius tendon is divided, I can then carefully see the posterior crust. I will then use a, a laser to divide, to further divide the posterior crust, which has been divided by the laser here. And then I would remove the posterior crust with the help of a needle after uh, dividing the incudostipedial joint and making sure I'm outside the capsule. Uh, I do not laser the anterior crust and usually a gentle a push towards a promontory will allow the suprastructure to fracture away and come out in total, and this can be completely and safely removed. Once this has been done, I would then use a laser to, uh, to, uh, to make perforation within the foot plate or make a rosette on the foot plate. And once I have made a rosette, I would then use a skeeter drill to, if the rosette has not caused a full perforation, I then use a skeeter drill to make a perforation in the foot plate. Now, in this scenario, you have to make sure that your perforation in the foot plate or your stapedotomy is as close as posterior as possible. I would then place the M prosthesis, M fix clip or the clip prosthesis with the open mouth parallel to the long process of incus. A, a needle is then gently used to swing the clip on the suprastructure, on the incus, and then subsequently an angle is used from behind to push, uh, and a right angle hook is used from behind to push the prosthesis onto uh, the long process of incus. And you will see it. And because of the shape of the prosthesis, it very gently slides on and locks in place. In my opinion, the commonest reason for erosion of the long process of incus is not because the somebody has crimped the prosthesis too hard, but it is because the prosthesis is very loose, or is very loose on the incus, uh, or a Teflon prosthesis has become loose on the incus, and it slides up and down the shaft of the incus, leading to a necrosis at the point of maximum friction or maximum vibration. Now, you may end up with some complications. Now, if the patient has got a biscuit foot plate, uh, and the moment you touch the skeeter drill, the, the, the plate can shatter or or, 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 or fracture. Alternatively, a part of the bone can form and fall into the vestibule, or the annular ligament can fracture, leading to subluxation of the edge of the foot plate into the middle ear. In these scenarios, you into the inner ear. In these scenarios, you can use a gentle right angle hook to lift the dislocated fragments out. However, if, but don't go venturing too deep into the vestibule or uh, because of the risk of giving a dead ear. And in such scenarios, you can either use a perichondrium or a vein graft to cover the area of a shattered foot plate and put a prosthesis on top. Again, if you end up with a floating foot plate, 
which is essentially a result of a vigorous manual instrumentation. Uh, this can be avoided by using a laser to cause a gentle fenestration of the foot plate if you have a laser. If not, try and very gently removing the foot plate either totally or partially, placing a vein graft or a perichondrium and putting a prosthesis on top of that. You can avoid it by uh, using this method, which I use uh, often, and it's called preservation stepidectomy. I'm not sure if you have seen it or before. And essentially, I would leave the entire suprastructure intact. And with the help of a perforator, I am making a hole parallel to the stapes suprastructure in the foot plate. I will then put my prosthesis in that hole that I have made with the foot plate. And I tried it with the, uh, with the medal uh, clip, M-Fix, and it works beautifully. You can see nothing has been curated. And I'm able to slide the piston or the prosthesis onto the long, pros onto the long process of Incus. And with a right angle hook, I have managed to gently slide it on, leading to slight tearing of the capsule. And then using a scissor to divide, micro scissor there to divide the superstructure and then using a joint knife to ensure that the capsule is fully divided. And I will soon show you an endoscope where you can see my prosthesis is sitting parallel to the suprastructure, which is fully intact and in place uh, and has not been removed. And the incus uh, is also there and the uh, uh, prosthesis is sitting on top of the long process of incus with the suprastructure fully intact. The benefit I find of this, of this technique is it is a bit challenging because if you notice, I've done all these operations with one hand because I've got the endoscope on the other hand. So with one hand, it is a bit more challenging and requires experience. However, on the plus side, the benefit is that your chances of developing a, 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 a shattering of the foot plate, avulsion of the foot plate, floating of the foot plate, or dislocation of the fragments medially or avulsion of the subluxation of the edge of the um, uh, um, uh, residual foot plate that is almost uh, negated because you haven't at all uh, dislocated the suprastructure or removed the suprastructure. And the results are very, very promising, actually are very good results with this. Now, if this was one of the first and the initial prosthesis I used uh, and I was still sort of getting to the hang of getting my measurements correct. And if you notice the bottom end of the prosthesis is in the fenestration and the top end is not sliding on. If you notice, I will try to use some gentle pressure. And as I try to slide it on, keep your eyes focused at the bottom end of the prosthesis. And with the gentle movement, you will realize the bottom end slides out of the fenestration or pings itself out, which means that my prosthesis was slightly longer. And that is why when I pushed the fulcrum with the, like a fulcrum angle, the bottom end slipped out. And you'll just see it slips itself out just now there. It, there it is, it slipped itself out. Uh, even though at the top, the piston is sort of trying to engage. When you are in this situation, do not force. You have used a longer prosthesis and you need to come back, adjust the prosthesis and go back in. And this patient, I used the prosthesis which was 0.25 millimeter shorter and uh, that went in very nicely and the patient had a complete closure of the airborne gap. Now you can develop subluxation of the incus about because it heals very nicely and gives very good results. At the same time, you can have fracture of the lenticular process of the incus as well. And if that happens, you can put a prosthesis with some bone cement on. However, you have to be 100% sure that when you're putting the bone cement on, there is no muco mucosa or no soft tissue on the long process of incus because the bone cement will not heal and you will end up with a granuloma in that area, which will actually compromise the results of the surgery in the long run. And when you come back in again, there will be granuloma which, had, which would have formed. 
At the same time, if uh, you identify that the facial nerve is bifurcating, please abandon the surgery if you're not confident in operating or if you can't see the foot plate. The second thing is, if there is perilymph identified around the foot plate, please avoid using laser because the fluid of the perilymph can boil or bubble, give rise to thermal injury to the facial nerve, and give rise to permanent irreversible loss of functioning of the facial nerve and compromise of hearing. Whilst using the laser, ensure that the laser is pointing away from the facial nerve, particularly if it is naked, if it is over or if it is overhanging. In fact, avoid using it in total and either use a manual perforator or just a simple skeeter drill. You can also make a gutter on the promontory to access the foot plate if you think the facial nerve is covering or partially covering uh, the uh, foot plate. If perilymph ooze uh, is developed, you can still proceed with the surgery by using either a gel foam or a perichondrial graft or a vein, or a vein uh, to prevent uh, um, uh, uh, continuous leakage. And there are some cases in the literature where they have put a lumbar drain. However, with the use of the CT scan and modern radiological techniques, this actually should not happen and should have been uh, should have been avoided in the first place. Now, post-operative complications uh, can be a facial paralysis. If it is because of laser or division of the nerve, you would have identified it immediately and probably attempted to reverse it, to, uh, to fix it either on the same operation or on the same day by a second operation after re-consenting the patient. It can be because of reactivation of the herpes virus. And in such cases, you can use steroids and antivirals very, very successfully. Do not rush to go in because the nerve was intact. The, 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 the commonest post-operative long-term complication is a conductive hearing loss. And this is probably because the prosthesis is either slipped off or the long process of incus has eroded. And in such cases, the, it is best and ideal to go ahead and replace the prosthesis. I have been in a position where the patient had um, uh, dizziness after surgery, and I went ahead and changed the prosthesis by a prosthesis which was 0.25 millimeters shorter and not further penetrating the vestibule and the dizziness settled. The patient developed dizziness on loud sounds and it settled with a slightly shorter prosthesis. You can still have these uh, complications which have been mentioned in the literature. However, fortunately, they are not that common. Now I will show you a video. I showed, we went through steps of the operation as I was describing it. And let's go through a video in full without breaking the sequence of events. So after successfully elevating a tympanometal flap and confirming otosclerosis, you can use a laser or a, a knife, a, a um, sickle knife, or a scissor to divide the stapedius tendon. Once the stapedius tendon is divided successfully, and you are able to identify the posterior cross, you can use a laser to divide the posterior cross safely. After division of the posterior cross, I would then dislocate the uh, stapes superstructure from the incus, making sure that I am going through the correct level, not going outside the capsule and not inside the capsule. Take off the long process of incus, uh, take off the stapes superstructure. Carefully and safely fracturing it away. Then I would use a laser to cause or make a rosette in the foot plate. And if my rosette is successful and I can see the perilymph through the rosette, then I do not need to undertake drilling. And in such scenarios, I can happily and safely proceed by putting my prosthesis in. Now, if you notice in this situation, it is very important how you angle the prosthesis with a sucker because the angulation of prosthesis is of most utmost importance to ensure that it is sitting parallel to the long process of incus with the open mouth 
facing northwards. In other words, facing towards the body of the Incas. And then you can use a needle to adjust the position. And once the open mouth sits in the correct position, you can use a right angle hook to slide it onto the superstructure safely, making sure the bottom end is sitting within your fenestration. I would then make sure that it is mobile by moving the malleus and the incus and assessing to see if I can identify the round window reflex. Usually you can see the fluid bubble gently moving and that means it has worked successfully. In the end, I would like to conclude by saying that this is, I always say that Stapy's operation for an otologist is the same as a rhinoplasty for a rhinologist. And just like in a rhinoplasty patient, you give patient time to digest the information and take time to think about it. You have to give time to patient to think. Always make sure the, that you have had a discussion regarding the use of a hearing aid with a patient. And finally, never go ahead to perform a Stavies operation with only one hearing test or one audiogram at hand. You should ideally have two audiograms performed at a gap of about uh, at two different intervals, giving you consistently similar results before you sign yourself to do a Stapes operation. And lastly, allow patient time to think in the freedom of having all the information with the, with the patient. I provide patient with an information leaflet and I send a copy of the letter to the patient, clearly mentioning to them 1% risk of dead ear in brackets, deafness and vertigo, and telling them a less than 1% risk of facial nerve injury, making sure this is highlighted in the letter and in the information leaflet so patient can have a chance to think in the real term. If the patient is not 100% sure, please do go ahead and give patient the option of trying a hearing aid out. You can always tell them that the stapy surgery is always available for them if they decide to do the operation at a later stage. And finally, these are results of my surgery over the last nine years. 109 years were operated upon. There was a gap during the COVID years, so the numbers are slightly lower. And I compared my results with the ENT UK, which was used as a target results. And I was happy and comfortable in saying that I do not at the moment have any complications. Um, and my hearing improvement is actually better than what is quoted in the literature. Um, and my results are complications of dead ear and facial paralysis was zero. One patient had temporary, two patients had temporary paralysis, which got better. Um, and one patient had slightly, uh, or uh, two patients had slightly worse hearing, two or three patients slightly worse hearing, but the rest of them had complete improvement of hearing. The ones where the hearing was worse were from my earlier years, when I was not doing a CT scan and probably they had some element of some degree of sclerosis elsewhere. Some references uh, uh, for uh, the um, audience to see. And um, that concludes my uh, presentation today. And I'm happy for questions. I will pass it back to yourself, Magdalena. Thank you. Yes. Thank you, Mr. Kayum. Very, very interesting presentation. Thank you so much for sharing this. Um, well, I don't know about the audience. I have tons of questions, <laughs> but I want to give, of course, the audience also the chance to type their questions and comments in the chat. Please feel free to do so. Um, in the meantime, what is for me always very interesting is the question when to switch from a hearing aid to a stapy surgery, because at some point the autosclerosis will lead to a hearing loss where the um, hearing aid might not be the perfect solution anymore. So what is your procedure here? So uh, in my experience, uh, if the hearing loss is more than 20 decibel conductive loss, I can provide patient with, I'm happy to discuss the option of stapedectomy. Mm -hmm. Now you will come across uh, a cohort of patients who have got quite significant conductive hearing loss with a compromised cochlear reserve. And in these patients, I will tell them that you have the option of a bone anchored hearing aid um, mm -hmm. Unfortunately, and I will show them the pictures of a bone anchored hearing aid or a bone conductor hearing aid. And the patients are not happy to wear the appendage on the side of the head. 
And in these cases, I will tell them that I'm happy to offer them stapes surgery. The, the surgery will not get rid of the hearing aid, but they will definitely be able to use the hearing aid better. And I've had about four or five patients on whom I've done this operation, and they, they, they were much happier to use the hearing aid, and they had a significant improvement of hearing. Though their sensory neural threshold was sitting at about between 40 and 50 decibels, but mm -hmm. their closure of the airborne gap allowed them to have a much better use of the hearing aid. Mm -hmm. Yes, that sounds really, really like a good solution to me. Yeah. And one thing I'd like to mention to the audience, which I forgot to mention, that there is a limitation of the MFIX prosthesis. And the limitation is that if uh, you have the incus, which is quite fat, the piston may not sit on the incus or you may not be able to slide it. And mm -hmm. I've had this problem twice in the last 109 years, I have, uh, years that I have operated upon, one with MFIX and one with the previous piston that I was using or previous uh, mm -hmm. prosthesis I was using. And in these cases, you may have to revert back to good old fashioned Teflon piston or a smart piston or one of the other pistons which, which have an open mouth, which can, where you need to either manually crimp it or use a laser to crimp it. Yes. Thank you. Yes, that is a very good point. Um, of course, with the clip prosthesis, it is a standardized um, opening, so to say. Um, and we tested it, of course, with the MFIX between 0.5 and 0.9 millimeters um, incus diameter. Um, within this this range, uh, the MFIX works perfectly fine. But as you say, if the incus is, is thicker, then um, a manually crimpable prosthesis might be the better choice for the patient in the long run. Yeah. Thank you for this. Um, still no questions in the chat, so this gives me the chance to ask more. <laughs> what I found really this interesting. Means either I, sorry? This means either I bored the audience. I said this means I might either I bored the audience or maybe the presentation was <laughs> a bit complicated. No, no, I'm sure they're just processing everything because <laughs> the presentation was really very impressive and a lot of uh, input, so really nice. <laughs> um, I found your uh, preservation stepidectomy also very, very interesting. So what you do basically is you um, just cut the um, or you uh, yeah, you cut the incudostipedial joint, but you keep the stapes super superstructure. So is yes. um, is the mobility um, well enough for the sound transmission if if the step is head is still there yes so what i do is i i go parallel to the footplate uh, parallel mm -hmm. to the superstructure and perforate the footplate or mm -hmm. make a fenestration in the footplate i then because the movement of the incus on the step is is is, is nanometers it's not mm -hmm. even millimeters so as long as i have divided the is the uh, isj mm -hmm. uh, and divided the stapedius tendon there is enough movement on the footplate to completely close the airborne gap okay uh, that is really really nice um i i think i saw it for the first time um and i think it's it's a good solution but i'm also wondering i, I guess it's very tricky to come to the footplate right to to make the perforation it is. It is. Um, it is. It's not. It's not something I would advise the present uh, the uh, the otologist to do straight away. I would say first master the trick with using a microscope in two hands, then use an endoscope to do grommets and then meringoplasties and then cholestatoma surgery and then ossicular reconstruction, and then eventually you can start using it for stapes once you are well versed with the situation and the location of the endoscope and the micro movements and the control of prosthesis uh, with one hand. Uh, mm -hmm. There's a question from one of the audience, uh, Isabella. A yes. question was, when do you, I prefer to use endoscope over a microscope? So uh, my first uh, instrument of vis uh, for visualizing is endoscope. And I use this as my main instrument uh, or main instead of microscope with which I visualize the area. However, if the auditory canal is tortuous or narrow, uh, or the angulation is not correct that I can put the endoscope straight in the ear. In those cases, I will not, I would avoid using the endoscope and then I would revert back to doing an end oral approach and put a self retainer in and using that approach to allow me better access. However, the first 
um, the primary instrument I would use to perform a stapedectomy or stapedotomy is an endoscope. Mm -hmm. Thank you. <laughs> Any more questions from the audience? Thank you. Perfect. Nice tips. Thanks a lot. So thank you very much. All right. I do have one last question, if you don't mind. Of course. <laughs> so of course, um, Magdalene. about the fenestration, so the perforation in the foot plate. How big do you usually make it? Or how um, large? Look, to be uh, so. Um, it is. It is now. It is difficult to say exactly how big I make it. Mm -hmm. So the diamond bird that I use is zero point six millimeter, mm -hmm. and I I would make a perforation with the diamond bird point six millimeter, and then I would sort of extend it a little bit more posteriorly towards the posterior crust. So I reckon my first fenestration is probably point eight millimeter, something like mm -hmm. in that region. Um, but when I use a, a, a perforator to perforate it, as I've been doing, as I did in the preservation technique, I would actually um, uh, uh, make, I do not know exactly what measurement it is, but I would make sure that it is large enough that I can, um, I can see a good reflection of the pulsating perilymph underneath. Okay, yeah. So, but you, you usually try to make it 0.2 or 0.3 millimeters larger than the piston itself. Yes, that's correct. Okay. And do you seal the perforation afterwards? No. No. Nothing. Okay. No there is, for... there is, uh, there is, I would always inject the, the, uh, the ear lobule in mm -hmm. case if I have to quickly get some fat, but mm -hmm. rarely have I ever needed to use a fat. Usually there is, there is enough uh, blood, et cetera, that it, he it heals or it seals and it closes itself. And mm -hmm. in reality, it within within um, forty eight to seventy two hours, you have got a clot that forms around it, uh, which will which starts the formation of the fibrosis. And the you know the uh, the age old concept of prosthesis slipping medially is mm -hmm. less common when we are using a fenestration, because in the older times the state where the stapedectomy was commonly performed where they would remove the foot plate totally or partially and mm -hmm. then put the prosthesis in uh, the prosthesis hardly would develop any fibrous bands around it however mm -hmm. now because we are doing a fenestration within the foot plate and the hole is only 0.2 or 0.3 millimeters wider than the size of the prosthesis there is there is always uh, if you have to go in for revision surgery, there is always a fibrous, a, a, a generous fibrous band that forms between the residual foot plate, the edges of the fenestration and the prosthesis and mm -hmm. holds it very nicely in place. Okay, I see. Oh, very interesting. Okay. So another point that I found really interesting is what you mentioned um, that um, Inca's um, erosion is mostly because of a too loose uh, prosthesis because I think for years the common opinion was that it is because of too tight crimping um, uh, so I find this really interesting and I think also here with the clip prosthesis this might be a solution um, because of the flexibility of the clip itself um, to have a less loose prosthesis so to say around the incus. That is correct so in the in, in, in the so in my experience I have done 109 cases, and I so far have not needed to revise a single procedure. Mm -hmm. The only one I needed to re revise was where the prosthesis was long yes. uh, and and the patient was getting dizzy. Um, the, I haven't needed to revise anything else. I have mm -hmm. asked, in my early years, I have sent one patient across to a colleague who uh, to revise, and, and that was patient developed a hearing, conductive hearing loss very earlier on, and he told me that the prosthesis was slightly shorter and had slipped out. Okay. So uh, so in 10 years, having done 109, oper in nine to 10 years, they having done 109 operations, not needed to revise a single one, uh, mm -hmm. makes me believe that the prosthesis, and I've always used clip prosthesis of various types, mm -hmm. makes me believe that uh, the problem is not with the prosthesis. The problem, if the problem is not, with this, with with um, uh, uh, is with the prosthesis rather than with the crimping, because if you look at the microanatomy of the incus, uh, the blood supply actually there are two blood vessels. One runs down the long process of incus, 
mm -hmm. the other one comes off from stapes superstructure. And usually there is an anastomosis at the level of the long process of incus. And that is why in cholestomas, there is pressure in the region of the long process of incus. And that is where the erosion always starts from. Mm -hmm. if, if, the, if the problem was with crimping, the patients should have developed erosion of the long process of incus very early. But usually these erosions of the long process of incus comes in time, which mm -hmm. again suggests that it is because of a prosthesis which has become loose and is vibrating and moving onto the long process of incus. And when mm -hmm. you speak to these patients, they will tell you that gradually over the years, their hearing has slightly deteriorated, which again suggests that it is a uh, the prosthesis which has become loose and has started to vibrate on the long process, which is giving rise to erosion rather than too tight a crimping. Mm -hmm. And the benefit of um, clip prosthesis, and particularly MFIX, because it balances beautifully. The MFIX balances better than any clip prosthesis I've ever used. Mm -hmm. uh, and it, 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 it sort of crimps, self crimps around the long process beautifully, very snug. And if I try to move it, I can't move it at all. And I've always tried to sort of take a right angle needle and see if I can move it up and down the shaft. It doesn't move. So it, it locks very nicely. And the weight of the prosthesis is very good. So it allows me to, it's very easy to put the prosthesis onto or anchor it onto the long process of incus. Thank you. Well, that, that sounds really nice. And I'm glad you like the prosthesis <laughs> so much. <laughs> All right, um, we have reached four o'clock uh, Central European time. Um, so this is yeah, time for us to end, unfortunately, even though I think we could have talked uh, more for hours. <laughs> Thank you so much, uh, Mr. Kayum, for your presentation and for your valuable contribution um, to our program. Um, I thank also the audience uh, for joining us, uh, for your questions, uh, for your interest. And I want to close this session today with an outlook to 2024, to the next session, which will be on January 17th. Um, it will be kind of um, a similar topic, but uh, a little further progressed, so to say. It will be a cochlear implantation in capsular autosclerosis with uh, Professor Schraven from Aachen in Germany. So if you have time, we will send out the newsletter um, in a timely manner, of course, and so you can register for this session also. Again, I thank you, Mr. Kayum, um, for your presentation. Thank you, audience, and see you again soon. Goodbye. And I wish everyone a very happy Christmas and a happy 2024. To you too. Thank you so much. <laughs> thank you. Goodbye. Thank you.